Well, it is a joy to be with you again this morning, and obviously we are uh, indeed very grateful um, for those who uh, have served in some capacity or another uh, in our nation's military. They've served their community um, and this country with, with honor and with valor uh, in whatever capacity that has meant, whether it's uh, here domestically or whether it's abroad. We are incredibly grateful uh, for your service to this country and for the cause of freedom um, around the world. And I, I say that with a, with a true sense of, of, um, uh, of, of awe. Um, I'm, uh, uh, my grandfather served on five fronts in World War II um, se several generations ago now. Um, and one of the things that I remember with, with so much um, sense of awe was the opportunity to just sit with him on so many occasions as a young teenager and ask him loads of questions uh, about his experience uh, in places like Dunkirk and in North Africa and, and in Iraq and also uh, in um, what's now Myanmar in, in Burma and so on and just hear all the different stories and what have you was, was absolutely fascinating. My grandmother, on the other hand, I couldn't get anything out of. Uh, she, she worked for MI6, uh, the, uh, the code breakers, uh, part of the secret intelligence service that was, uh, you know, f uh, fussing with those... Uh, with all that data that was coming in from the German U-boats and so on, and, and uh, at, uh, at Bletchley Park. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, the movie that came out about that just recently. Um, but they were all sworn to secrecy. And I says, Grandma, come on now. It's been like you know, 50 years since the war. Surely the, uh, the official secret act has, has, you know, has, you know, the duration has passed, and you can tell us something. But she was mom. Uh, until she died. She'd never tell us anything, which was very disappointing. But all that to say, we value highly um, that, uh, you know, those, those of you who have served in, this, in, our, in our nation's history, um, whether it be recently or whether it be decades ago, we are so grateful for your service. And we recognize that the freedoms which are clearly been uh, being undermined today in our day and era um, are what you fought valiantly for and uh, what we are grateful for and that I think for many of us now we must recognize that the fight for our freedoms and the fight for us to cherish and to preserve the traditions upon which we founded this country and our civilization are going to take a different form of a fight. Uh, it may not necessarily be just a fight against uh, flesh and blood, but it is a fight in the spirit that we must engage in this day and this era in order to preserve uh, the cherished freedoms that we hold to be uh, the foundation of our civilization. And so that's a call for all of us. Their example is an example that is set for all of us to fight the good fight. And it's not a fight, as I mentioned, against flesh and blood. It's a fight against principalities and powers. It's a fight uh, in the spiritual world. It's an intellectual fight in many ways. And in fact, because it is such, perhaps we need to be careful on the terminology we use with regards to quote-unquote fight. It's a discussion. It's a engaging the culture. It's, a, it's, it's being salt and light. It's being compassionate. It's, it's finding ways that we can sow seeds of the kingdom of God into our culture uh, in the best way that we should know how and with the influence that God has granted us to. Uh, granted us with. And so with that, I think that's a great segue with what I want to share about this morning. Over the last number of times that I have been here, I've been looking at uh, the responsibility that we have in Christ to our work. The work that we find value in, the work that we find meaning with, the work that God uses as a means by which we are to spread the message and the light and the wisdom of the kingdom of God. Over the last several times that I have been here, the last two messages in particular, I have focused on the mission of work. We've looked at our mission in exile as we are called to be like those in the city of Babylon, the, the great pagan city 
of the ancient world that I think is so similar to our own day and era that we find ourselves in. And the message there, of course, is that we are to be those that are in the world without becoming of the world. <clears throat> Last time I was here two weeks ago, we focused on the context of the work. And we look particularly at the world in which we live and the context in which we find ourselves in amidst this great information age that we find uh, that we are surrounded by and that we work in. We discuss the whole issue that we live in an era where there is a massive quantity of information that is being thrown at us on a day-to-day -day basis and that we find ourselves in the midst of a distraction surplus and an information abundance. And yet in the midst of that, we find ourselves dealing with a wisdom deficit. Information abundance, wisdom deficit, and that our job is to be those that are providing wisdom in an era where there really is a lack of wisdom and understanding, despite the fact that we live in such an abundance of information. So we've dealt with the mission. We've dealt with the context. Today, I would like to turn our attention to the content of our work. The title of our message, I have elaborated on it a little bit more since I gave it to Peter, and he's getting used to, to texting me now and asking me for the title on Friday, and usually by Sunday, the title has morphed and grown and changed. But the title today that I want to provide you with is Value Creators, Value Curators, and Value Traders. Value Creators, Curators, and traders. We're dealing this morning with the content of our work. The content or the product of our work is to produce value. Let me describe the terms. I think we all know what we mean by, by, by the term value, but, but let me define it for you because I think it, it provides more weight to what it is that we're talking about this morning. From an ordinary dictionary standpoint, value is defined as the importance, the worth, or the usefulness of something. The importance, the worth, or the usefulness of something. But I think Webster's 1828 dictionary, one of our founding fathers who, who provided us with a fabulous uh, dictionary, he provides value a lot uh, with a lot deeper meaning when he says, value is the worth of a thing which renders it useful, and the real value of a thing is its power or capacity to produce good. The power of or capacity of producing what is good. We also can take it a step further when we look at the Greek definition of the word value, which is to make better or to make excellent. So as we look at what we're dealing with this morning, we are trying to ask the question, what is it about the content of my work where I am seeking to bring something better or to produce something more excellent that is going to be about producing what is good in the company or the organization in which I am called to work? To add value, we are raising the power or the capacity of a thing to become more useful in producing what is good. And my argument this morning is, is that I'm going to be compelling you to create value through your work as a means by which the reason that God has placed you and put you into your place of calling. We are created to bring value through our work. And in fact, he desires to fellowship with us through our work. And when we do fellowship with him through our work, we will have the capacity to create, to curate, and to trade value in our place of influence. And I'm going to unpack those three areas of creation, curation, and value a little later on in our time this morning. This call to be those that generate value is something that goes back to the very, very beginning of the story. If you look with me in Genesis chapter 2, what we see in Genesis chapter 2 is all three of these areas of mission, of context, and of content with regards to what it is we are to produce. 
as you look at the story of creation and how God places us in the garden, we see that our purpose is that, that the garden is created perfectly but also insufficiently. It seems hard for us to, to imagine that a God who is so wise, who is so perfect and who is so good and creates everything with such a strategic mind that he creates what is good and yet it is also something that is insufficient. Not insufficient because of sin, not insufficient because there is some kind of defect, but by intention, God creates a milieu, he creates a garden that is imperfect waiting for the primary insertion into that environment. And that, of course, was the creation of man. We see that as he creates every single part of that creation, we see that it is good. He creates the light, it's good. He creates the day and the evening, it is good. He creates the, the trees and the skies and the, and, the, and the planets, and it is good. But there's something about it that is still missing. And we see in Genesis 1, 26 and through 28 that when he introduces man into that garden, that he gives man an additional purpose. The purpose of stewardship. Verse 26, And God blesses man and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and over the, everything that crawls and moves on the earth. He goes on in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 5. This is where I'm talking about the fact that he created it good, but there is a sense of deficiency. There was no bush of the field that was yet in the land, and no small plants of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord had not yet caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. It's not that that was a problem, but there was a sense of, of incompleteness that was yet to be solved. Verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. To work it and to keep it. I think it's important that we recognize that this sense of insufficiency in the garden was not a result of sin. We are yet to see the fallenness of man that would unfold later on in that chapter 2. Work, therefore, is not the result or the consequence of the curse. The mandate that was given was given so that Adam and Eve would be able to steward the garden and increase its capacity to produce what was good. Why? So that they could provide value to one another. It's amazing that God places Adam and Eve in the garden, not amidst such an abundance that, that they would not have to do anything, but in a place where they would be able to enjoy the fruit of being in that garden, but it would still require work because in cultivating and providing work, it communicates love to the person whom I desire to serve, my spouse. And of course, the children that would come thereafter. Work is not a curse. Work is the means by which we provide value and blessing to those around us. True value is provided when we use the gifts that God has given us to bless others also with that value. Work is the primary means by which we provide value to society. In his book, Lester de Costa, in the book entitled Work, The Meaning of Life, he says, work is the form in which we make ourselves useful to others. Work creates civilization and culture. I want you to hear that. Work creates 
civilization and culture. And I think that that's particularly important to recognize and understand when civilization is under such attack, that what is it that not only preserves civilization, but if civilization is eroded, what is it that creates civilization? It is our work. He goes on to say, goods and services are not produced as ends in themselves. Either they benefit others or there is no demand for their doing. Work is the way that we make ourselves useful to society. And so the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, is what is it that God values for people that we should be in the business of excelling in order to provide? Not just selling, but excelling in. People are not interested in in just us selling something to them. They want us to excel in producing something that is of truly a value that they are going to want. And therefore, the money, the monetary aspect of that or the profit margin in that is, is secondary. Our first priority is that we discover what it is that provides value and produce it in a way that is going to bring excellence that blesses other people. And in return, we derive profit. Profit is secondary. We serve others by bringing what God values to them. The problem is, is that our world defines value very differently from perhaps we do, and certainly perhaps differently from how Scripture does. We assign value in what provides us with pleasure, we as in the world. We, are we okay? Okay, sorry. It must be one of those amber alerts, I think. So lots of phones will be going off. Uh, we provide value by what speaks to that aspect of that, that inner desire in people to find security, to find freedom, to find hope, to find meaning, to provide value. It's not just about providing comfort. I had an experience with this last time I was in the UK, not that long ago. I had the opportunity to take a, a, a bunch of um, uh, high school students on a trip uh, to London. And um, I had the opportunity, we had some, some downtime, and so they all wanted to go shopping. And I was like, okay. And we had kind of done the regular shopping. We still had a little bit more time left. And I said, all right, I said, I want to, take, I want to share with you a shopping experience that's going to blow your mind, that's going to take you to a whole other level of understanding how, we attri how the world attributes value to the things that perhaps we enjoy. So they're like, okay, great, where are we going? I said, let's go to Harrods. How many of you here maybe have been to the UK, been to Harrods? All right, you know what I'm talking about. One of the most expensive um, uh, department stores in the world. And so I take them to Harrods and I'm thinking, they're, they're not going to be able to afford anything in this place, but they wanted to go nonetheless anyway. And so I thought, okay, we're going to have a game. And so I kind of gather them in the lobby as we, as we entered the building and I said, all right, we're all on a text chat here. The game is going to be is you're going to, we're going to text one another and see who can find the most expensive item in this store. And so they're like, okay, this sounds like a lot of fun, you know. Um, let's kind of go off and see what we can find. And so, of course, we started off in, in uh, kind of women's apparel, which is kind of like the main part that you enter into, a lot of purses and handbags and stuff. And so the text string starts to light up with the excited students. Wow, you know, I found a, a purse for $400. That's amazing. And then somebody else finds another one for $2,000. They're like, whoa, you know, and there's all these like thumbs up and exclamation marks on the text and that kind of thing. Then somebody else, you know, gets into um, the technology area and they, they find... Um, They've, I don't know, I couldn't remember what it was now, but oh, I remember. It was a Bluetooth speaker, a Bluetooth speaker for, I don't remember how much it was, but it was thousands of dollars, okay, four or five thousand dollars. And they go, this is incredible. Somebody else gets into the homewares area and they find a chess set, beautiful marble chess set. And then the price tag comes through $35,000, okay. 
And, and so and it just kind of keeps getting worse and worse in terms of, uh, you know, the amount of money that people are willing to spend on ridiculous things. Um, and even things that would be consumed in an instant. Uh, another person made it down into the wines and spirits section, and they found um, a bottle of whiskey for $18,000. Okay, absolutely ridiculous. Um, Somebody else makes it into the area where they're selling, uh, you know, furniture and all this kind of thing. A bed set, you know, headboard, footboard, maybe two, uh, you know, bedside tables. That was all. A hundred and twenty thousand dollars for a bed set. Okay. And so I thought, okay, I, I think I, I know how to blow them all out of the water. <laughs> and so I went down to the jewelry department. And, uh, you know, and, and there's lots of little kind of uh, boutique stores within Harrods. And I went into the one that looked like it probably was the most expensive. And there was a gentleman in there, uh, you know, behind the counter. And, of course, I thought, well, I might as well just be completely honest with him. So I went straight up to him and I said, listen, I'm here with a bunch of students. And I told them what we were doing. Uh, and he said, oh, he said, that's so fun. He said, that's, that's great. He said, you should just bring them. Because I, I said to him, I said, I think they're a little afraid to come in here because there's no price tags on anything. And, he, and I said, I think they're a little afraid to come in here and ask. He said, oh, he said, you should just bring them on in anyway. He says, well, they'll have a great time. And so I bring the students in. And there's about five or six of them. And, uh, and he said, okay, you want to see the most expensive item? They were like, yeah. Took him over. There was this beautiful diamond necklace. There's one single diamond, 10 carats, absolutely enormous diamond, beautifully, exquisitely, uh, you know, crafted and so on and so forth. No price tag. And we were like, okay, <laughs> what's the price? 1.1. 1.1 million dollars for a diamond necklace. And the kids left that on one level with this kind of sense of awe and amazement. You know, uh, we live in a relatively affluent area here in, in Bellevue, but the reality is in comparison to what they experienced there, that was nothing. And for them to, to be able to get a recognition of, of what kind of value the world attributes to material items was on one level absolutely startling and amazing, but on the other hand, it was also really sickening. The sense that we could attribute thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars even into something that could be consumed, that couldn't even necessarily be passed on from one generation to another, such as alcohol. Two parables that I want to provide you this morning illustrate this contrast between what the world values and what the kingdom of God values. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, the parable of the hidden treasure. Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And I want you to almost picture for a moment that 10-carat that diamond over a million dollars in value. Actually, that was 1.1 million pounds, which would be about 1.4 or 5 million dollars, given the exchange rates. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, that was quite a common uh, action that people would do back in uh, ancient times when they found something that was valuable or if they had something that was valuable because they lived often in such uncertain times, surrounded with conflict, surrounded by wars, economic turmoil and everything else. There, there was the usual um, attitude was to hide things that were of value during times of uncertainty. I think that speaks to 
where we find ourselves today. We are in such uncertain times. And not only are we now in such certain times that we don't know what to do, but that there is a sense that what we have that we know is of such value is under attack and needs to be placed into a position where it can be preserved. How are we posturing to preserve the values that we have in times of conflict. But the other thing that I want you to glean from this particular parable, it's just a short parable, just this one verse, is that acquiring these values requires trading a worldly set of values to preserve, in order to preserve a kingdom set of values. Notice that it says that in his joy, he goes and sells in order that he can buy. There has to be a trading that takes place. Selling one thing and upgrading and purchasing something else. I want us to be able to recognize here something very carefully. It's not that worldly things are necessarily evil things and heavenly things are necessarily good things and that we must get rid of the worldly things in order to have the more spiritual things. That's not what we're trying to get at here. What we're trying to recognize here, there is a priority. It's not that one thing is good, the other thing is bad, and that there is a zero-sum balance. The degree to which I can have heavenly things is the degree to which I shed myself of earthly things. That's not what we're talking about here. The issue is the priority upon which we generate the sense of value. There is use to the worldly things. But there also needs to be attributed value on the things that are truly going to last and that truly bring benefit to other people. The second parable moves right on from it. The next verse, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. That word pearls there can also be defined as jewels, just like the, the 10 carat diamonds that the students were ooing and ahhing over. It's like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. We must be those that are looking for how we can find and discover and curate and create and trade value in the world that God has called us to. The problem is that we... With value, it is all too often determined by the eye of the beholder. As I mentioned, non-Christians tend to place ultimate value in material things. And on the other hand, we have Christians who tend to place ultimate value only on spiritual things. The reality is, is that if God has created both the spiritual and the natural, then there is value that can be found in both. God is the Lord over all. He's the Lord over all that is spiritual and all that is temporal. And therefore, this this division between what is spiritual and what is temporal is a false dichotomy that undermines our ability to create and to trade meaningful value in our world. We can provide godly value through our work, through the physical things that we create. The parable is really about recognizing the value of the kingdom. And the kingdom is about sharing righteousness, peace, and joy in the now, in this world, not in some spiritual world in the future only. It's about bringing the kingdom of God into the here and the now. We pray, oh God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? In in heaven? In the new millennium? No, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. So our challenge is to determine how we tangibly create, curate, and trade value in managing products, in managing resources, in managing relationships through our work. So first, creating value. How do we go about creating value? I've got a list of about nine or so things. It's not a comprehensive list by, list by any stretch, but nine or so things that we can do that actually generate value through our work. First of all, beginning with wealth. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. I want to read this verse to you because I think it's a verse that we've heard many times, but I want, to, I want you to hear it in terms of its application. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. He says right here, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. But why? That he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. The covenant is the value that we are bringing. It's the sense of security. It's the relationships. It's the definition of agreements. It's the definition of terms by which we relate and enjoy covenant and community. It's what provides us with meaning. It's what provides us with value. It's what provides you with community. And wealth is the means by which we are able to establish those things. We celebrate here today the work, the value of our servicemen and women since it's Memorial Day weekend. And one of the primary means by which we do that is we pay taxes so that a government can provide security so it can pay for its armed services that provide security for us as a civilization. And so in other words, we create wealth, we pay our taxes so that we can live in a secure society. We create value by generating wealth that provides us with a sense of social order and community. We create value by solving problems. We've talked about this before with uh, Daniel the prophet being in the midst of Babylon when there was nobody else to define and, and to solve the problems. He was the only one, it says in Daniel 5 verse 12, who understood how to break the enigmas how to solve the problems. We look at another example of how we can create wealth. It's to design more efficient systems. Look at Jethro as the example in Exodus 18. Moses was overwhelmed with the sheer quantity of the legal cases that he was, have to, that he was having to deal with as the founder of the nation, that he was getting burnt out. And Jethro comes to him and creates a, a, a legal system where, it, where we, de, we, we devolve power down to the local level and we create a system of checks and balances where we divest power at other levels and we're able to, to, to spread the load. We create efficient systems. That was creating value in the young nation at that time. We create value by things of beauty that we create. The gifted artisans in Exodus 31 that were hired to decorate and beautify the tabernacle of Moses as a way in which they would be able to express the glory of God. Not that they were worshipping that beauty, but, the, but beauty nonetheless was, was something that was attributed to the items in the temple as a way of reflecting the glory of God. You see, I think so often we, 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 we think that we live in this kind of zero-sum world where it's either this or that. We either live in the spiritual or we live in the, temp uh, or we live in the temporal. We either give ourselves to worshipping mammon or we give ourselves to a vow of poverty. No, it, it can be both. It is possible to worship God and yet still put value into the things that we are creating that are a part of our worship. 
We create beauty, not to be worshipped, but to be enjoyed as a reflection of his beauty. We create value by resolving conflict. Jesus says, Matthew 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. We bring value by solving these conflicts, by bringing people together, by listening and understanding, helping them to understand one another and bringing those resolutions to bear. We create value by being those that can plan strategically. Think about Joseph, who created a long-term agricultural policy and infrastructure to deal with a global famine before it arose. He plans strategically, and as a result, the nation of Egypt benefited from the value that he brought to his work. We bring value by bringing healing into our place of work. Elijah healed a Syrian military commander in order to get his attention, 2 Kings chapter 5. We bring value by dispensing understanding and wisdom. Look again to the example of Daniel that I have alluded to in previous times that I have been here where he provides that level of wisdom and understanding in the midst of a vacuum of knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And lastly, we create value by training and empowering other people. Paul commands his son, his spiritual son, Timothy, in chapter 2, 2 Timothy, verses 1 and 2, where he commands them to train other leaders in the truth. <clears throat> we, we bring value when we train and empower people in truth to do what it is that they are called to do. So how do we go about being in a place where we can bring some of these different aspects to bear of creating value in our work. I encourage you to, to take a value inventory. Ask yourself these questions. What gifts and talents has God put in you? Think about the gifts and the talents that you have that are God-given that you can excel in, that you can bring as a blessing to the organizations, to the companies, to the people that you work with. Your gifts and talents are a way that you bring that excellence, that you bring and improve the situation around you. Your gifts and the talents are the way in which you bring about the values of the kingdom. Secondly, when was the last time that they were used effectively? Perhaps it's been a while, and you need to ask yourself, what is it that is preventing me? That's the third question, in fact, that I want to ask you. What is preventing you from contribute, contributing value through your gifts and talents? Maybe it's fear, fear of rejection, the fear that those gifts and talents maybe don't measure up to the gifts and talents of others. Maybe it's unbelief. Maybe it's comparison with others. Whatever the reason is that, that is causing you to be hesitant in your contribution, you need to shed yourself of those things. Ask yourself the question, the tough question, why is it that I am holding back? And deal with those reasons because it is God who desires to work in you and through you as his means of dispelling and bringing value to others. Perhaps the fourth question is one that you need to wrestle with. Do you need to develop your skills in those gifts and talents, maybe through further education or training, maybe through coaching? But it requires humility because it requires recognizing, yeah, I have a gift and a talent, but it's become dull. It's, it's been unused. It's been sitting on the shelf. In comparison to others, maybe, maybe I do need to have an honest comparison and recognize I buried that talent. And when compared to others, it is a little rusty. 
And that that comparison is helpful in the sense it deals with reality and enables you to come to a place of humility, but then to a place of faith, recognizing that this talent can be dusted off, it can be polished, it can be improved. Because if I come in humility, I believe that God can blow on that talent and bring it to life. We are to be those that are creating value. But we're also to be those that are curating value. It's not a term that we hear very often. I think it's easy to think about creating value because we often use the term create as, as a very positive term in our culture today. But what about curating value? What does it mean to curate something? A curator is somebody that takes care of something that doesn't belong to them. It's a, a term that we often use as a curator of an art gallery or a museum. In other words, that a curator of an art gallery is probably somebody who loves art, who might dab in a little art themselves and create a little art themselves, but they really appreciate the beauty of the masters. And a curator is somebody who has the ability to, yeah, I, I certainly could paint something for the muse, this museum if I, if I wanted to, but it's never going to be to the standard and the, and, and the caliber of the masters. And so my job is to bring in the masters. My job is to make the connections to, and to figure out how we bring in the best talents and see how we can then distribute that talent to the widest group of people possible. And so to be those that are curating value, we are not just creating value ourselves, but we're in the business of discovering and acknowledging the value of others. We are not insecure when we look at others and go, well, I, I can't arise to that. But instead, we are able to, to see the, the wonder of, of, of the capability that exceeds ours as we look at somebody else and go, you know what, I could really figure out how we could put that to good use. We discover and acknowledge the value of others and we implement that value of others so that they can become a blessing. It's not all about me being a blessing, it's about how to tap into and empower others so that they too can be a blessing in the organization in which we are a part of. How do we become good at curating value in others? By becoming a little less self-conscious and more socially aware of others. By asking questions and listening to the stories of others. But it's not also curating value through people. It's also creating value through things. We are called to steward the resources of the earth. Curating value means that we must understand our market so that you can see what is missing. What is it that's not being provided? And what can be done to curate new value that will bring benefit to other people that is being missed? Curating value is also about discerning people's future needs, foreseeing problems that we might potentially have to be dealing with in the future and therefore curate value, bring together resources and accumulating them in such a way that when the time comes, when the need suddenly is realized, we've got those things ready to bring about as a blessing to others. And I think Joseph in that sense was a key example as one who was a curator of value, not just a creator of value. Joseph lived in a time of economic abundance. There was a massive influx of grain. There was no need to, 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 to have a sense that, well, we need to store up some because we have such an abundance at this time. We have, our, our, our needs are fully being met. But yet at that time, little did they realize 
that there was a famine that was coming. And Joseph was one that had the ability to see the dream that the Pharaoh had alerting to them of, of, to alerting them of that future famine. And as a result, he put into plan the ability to curate or to accumulate resources during a time of abundance. I wonder in this time of abundance that we find ourselves in, whether we should be in a place where we are curating not just financial resources, but we're curating all kinds of resources that we potentially will need when we come into times of difficulty that lie ahead. Creating value, curating value. The last aspect of that, that I want to touch on this morning is trading value. That we are not just to accumulate all of these great things and these great benefits that God has given us, the skills, the resources, the finances, and everything else that God has granted to us, that we don't hoard those things to ourselves, but that we trade and that we implement and that we grant and we give those, those resources away. Creating value in others is to sow value into a person's design, a person's dignity, and a person's destiny. Let me just say that again. We trade value, we create value in others when we sow into them in such a way that we are sowing into their design, their dignity, and their destiny. Some things, some, some practical things that we can do to trade value. Discern not just the future needs, but discern the current needs of others that can be met with your unique gifts and talents. That requires, secondly, becoming a good listener. It also requires that we provide positive feedback and affirmation to peers and those under you. By doing that, we are creating and we are passing on and we're trading value with people as we, as we provide positive feedback and affirmation as to who they are and what they are producing. We must discern, fourthly, how to serve your, your organization beyond the job description that you have been given. I don't know how many times, it's so frustrating, you're dealing with people and you ask a, for a particular thing and seemingly it's not that, you're not asking for much. So I'm sorry, that's, that's not in my job description. Well, I mean, could you at least point me towards somebody that maybe that job description is? Or is it too difficult to go a little out of your way or what have you? You know, But we need to be good at those who are serving our organizations, serving our clients, serving our customers beyond just the job description. And that goes to the next point. We've got to seek feedback from our clients, our customers, and even our bosses to evaluate whether they are being blessed and receiving value beyond their expectation. See, the job description I've been given is just an expectation. That's the expectation that has been put on me that I am going to provide this set of value to my organization. Am I exceeding that? And let me not be the one that is asking that question. I mean, I should ask that question too, but, but let me take a step of courage and ask others, do you think I'm exceeding the expectation that you have and that I'm, being, that I'm adding value to this organization by, by giving value beyond your expectations? It feeds into my last point, which is be a team player. Something that you see that is needed to be done may not be your responsibility, but by doing that simple thing, it provides value. It may not be your purpose to come in and, and start the coffee in the morning and have to dump out the old grounds, but you are providing value just by setting that example of serving your team. It may not be your responsibility to clean up that kitchen. It may not be your responsibility to go that extra mile, to make that extra phone call. 
do whatever it is. But by doing so, we are producing excellence. We are producing service. We are producing value. When we trade value, when we trade true value, our goods, our services, our relationships, they have an evangelistic dimension to them because we are bringing an attribute of the kingdom of God. I aim with this scripture that I think I began with when I first started this series on work. Jeremiah chapter 29, where we found the mission of our work, particularly for those that were called into the place of exile. Called out of the promised land into the place of exile. Jeremiah writes to them in chapter 29 and he says this in verse 5. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. In other words, create value. But not just for themselves. Verse 7. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find Welfare. By welfare, I'm not talking about the welfare state. I'm talking about value, security, peace, community, goodness, purpose, thriving, abundance. Seek the value of of the city, not the values of the city, but value in the city. And as we do that, we also will find that peace, that security, and so on. The mission of work, the context of work, the content of work. As we begin to focus on these areas, I believe that the Lord can grant us the opportunity to be so much more engaged and so much more productive and so much more fulfilled, despite the fact that we live in the chaos around us that we find ourselves in, that God has called us to thrive in the midst of that chaos. And by thriving, we can be those that not only preserve the values of our culture, but that we demonstrate the goodness of those values and those values in turn can be evangelistic and that as everybody else seemingly destroys those values and then comes to the recognition of what they are left with, nothing, that they once again will ask, the, ask, ask us the question, what must we do to rebuild and we bring those things out from the place that we have preserved them and we're able to work once again to rebuild our culture. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have granted us the privilege of being able to work to provide value to others, to provide value to our world. What an awesome responsibility it is. Lord, that you, you could have just decided on your own. Nope, I'm the only one that's of true value and of true worth, and so I'll just do that. Thank you very much. But Lord, you choose to use us broken vessels. You choose to use us imperfect vessels through which we can be a vehicle to bring your value. And so this morning, Lord, whatever our excuses are, whatever our mindsets are where we've told ourselves, well, you know, I really, I, 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 there's no way that I can bring much of worth. There's no way I can bring much of anything. The Lord, that we shared those mindsets this morning and that we recognize that with you in us, with you in us, Lord, we bring value to everything, every person, every organization, every community, every family that we touch. 
We thank you for this awesome responsibility. And we ask, Lord, that you would enable us and equip us to engage that responsibility more fully. In Jesus' name.